everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a minute after, so it looks like we've got a um, majority of folks that are, are joining us for the webinar. I just want to welcome you. This is the webinar on supporting open science, data curation, preservation, and access by libraries. Um, this is a webinar jointly presented by uh, two organizations, Center for Open Science and Internet Archive. We're, we're very happy you're here. and We're um, excited about talking with you today about a collaborative project that we've been working on um, to develop uh, preservation workflows. And we're really interested in um, trying to drive forward with some feedback um, in this webinar and get your um, get your input on a few items. We'll be uh, conducting the webinar using Zoom and some of the features that I wanna point out to you um, are the Q&A. Um, so I know there's two sort of chat features. There's the chat and then there's Q&A. We would like to ask you to use the Q&A box to ask us questions or make comments. Um, that way we can um, leverage these throughout the uh, webinar to answer questions. And at the end, we'll read through a lot of these to have a little bit more discussion about some of the questions and feedback that are coming up. Um, so with that, I uh, want to sort of kick us off with our first um, poll, which is another feature that we're gonna be using throughout. This is um, sort of a live polling feature that'll help us gather feedback on specific questions that we're really interested in, in learning um, from you as we work through some of the content we have to share. So this first poll um, is about the, the what are the key um, priorities for preservation at your institution. And we've got a few um, ideas there that might resonate with you, some themes that we thought made sense. But obviously, if, if there's something there um, that you don't see, feel free to pop it in the Q&A and that's really useful feedback for us as well. So with that, I'm gonna introduce the panelists for this webinar today. I'm Nikki Pfeiffer, I'm Director of Product at the Center for Open Science. Um, my colleague is Eric Olson and I'll let him introduce himself. Thanks, Nikki, I'm Eric Olson. I'm on uh, Nikki's team here at uh, the Center for Open Science, uh, working, uh, managing one of the other products on the OSF uh, for universities, labs, and other organizations called OSF institutions. And I'll pass it over to Jefferson from Internet Archive. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm Jefferson Bailey. I'm Director of Web Archiving and Data Services at Internet Archive. And I'll hand it over to Lori. Great. Thanks, Jefferson. Um, I'm Lori Donovan, and I'm Senior Program Manager for Web Archiving and Data Services here at the Internet Archive. And thanks all for joining. Great, so I'm gonna kick it off. If you have recently joined, I think the poll is maybe still open or here are the results. If it's not open, there are, just a reminder for new participants, there'll be some polls uh, over the course of the presentation. Please respond or if the uh, answer is uh, the auto-filled answers uh, are not enough. Please uh, feel free to put stuff in the Q&A uh, for other answers to specific questions. We are uh, talking about a collaborative project between uh, Center for Open Science and Internet Archive. And this is a moment in that project where we really uh, want as much input and feedback from the community as we can get. So please participate in the polls and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, either in the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll have uh, only a chance to ask questions at the end. So I'm kicking off the slide deck. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the Internet Archive, we are a nonprofit digital library uh, founded in 1996. Uh, the picture uh, in the slide is our actual building. We bought a church. Uh, our headquarters is in San Francisco. This uh, slide is from an era when we encouraged people to come and visit. Uh, obviously, <laughs> not rea reality right now, uh, but at some point in the future, if you are around, we do welcome visitors. Uh, we run a lot of our own data centers and uh, the church is part of it is still a church and part of it is where people work. So it's an interesting place to visit and we encourage visitors. Uh, our mission statement is universal access to all knowledge. Uh, people often are interested in hearing about how much stuff we currently have uh, at the Internet Archive. We did, of course, start uh, archiving uh, the web, but uh, have certainly broadened our scope over the years. Uh, to many other types of uh, collections and formats. So there's the sort of number slide of all the stuff we have, uh, millions of these, millions of those, 
Uh, the web uh, archive does constitute about half the collection. Uh, so we are approaching one trillion uh, web documents archived since uh, 1996. Um, and the total collection is somewhere in the 80 petabyte range uh, as a single copy. We, of course, have many more copies than that. So uh, that's how much uh, of the content. Uh, our, our role within the Internet Archive and the Web Archiving and Data Services, uh, we obviously do a lot of web archiving and data services. Uh, that includes both some uh, products and services that many may be familiar with, uh, as well as customized uh, web development or indexing or analytics services that are done on a more contractual uh, basis. Um, archive it is our sort of uh, Software as a service product for uh, building collections of websites. Uh, it has over 750 institutional users. It's about 60 to 65 percent uh, universities, uh, usually the university library or the archive or research effort or uh, records department or things like that that are collecting uh, for many different purposes stuff that's on the web. Uh, and we do a lot with other library archives and museums in a mission aligned way as well as governments, not-for-profits, NGOs, uh, all those sorts of things. We do, uh, many of these services are paid services. Uh, that's a big part of our role within the archive is helping support Internet Archive overall uh, through paid services. But of course, we're a nonprofit and, and archive.org and Internet Archive does a lot, uh, you know, for free and you can upload stuff and you can, of course, use most of the collections. Uh, well, all the collections, I guess, without paying. Uh, so we do have a sort of a multifaceted sort of cost model. Some things are paid, some things are at cost, some things are free. For our group, uh, we, working with these seven to 800 institutions every year, bring in somewhere around 1.5 to 2 petabytes ourselves uh, with, uh, as part of the larger organization per year and about 5 billion uh, digital objects, mostly from the web, but sometimes we're getting them directly from uh, non-web repositories, uh, our content transfers, or things like that. Uh, we do uh, a lot of open source software development. Uh, we work a lot in the open data, open science, open research space as well, uh, and have many partnerships with mission-aligned organizations, both through grant-funded efforts as well as through just strategic uh, partnerships that might be co-development of tools and software, or they may just be community building and advocacy efforts. So that's our that's our group. And I'll hand it over to her. Thanks, Jefferson. So um, you'll see a bit of a, a theme here. Our mission uh, aligns well with our friends at, at Internet Archive um, and really at the, the high level our mission is increase openness, integrity, uh, and reproducibility of research and seeing that there's really not one without um, all of those concepts and, and uh, integrating those into culture change in research. And we don't see that as, as just a technology problem or just a, a cultural uh, culture change uh, catalyzation. There's, there's a little bit of all of that involved. Um, so our organization is actually structured to take that into account. So we have three distinct teams within the Center for Open Science. We have a, a policy team that explores uh, the incentives to embrace change that organizations have already begun using or are uh, considering and sometimes even consulting with us as they consider those uh, incentives for researchers a research team that is evaluating how all of these uh, policies or other encouragements or technology, um, are they facilitating or cultivating uh, the change that we expect? Um, and if so, you know, how effective are those? Um, and then we have an infrastructure team that uh, Nikki and I are on um, that helps to, to build and maintain technology that enables uh, that change to really take hold and, and be embraced by communities. And this is a, an image we like to, to use to frame that conversation and one you've no doubt seen in other contexts before uh, the diffusion of innovations and uh, it really certainly applies in our space uh, as well. And with open science adoption, not just the OSF, but open science practices and uh, 
and resources, we'll see that there are innovators. They'll, they'll run at cool new tools or services that really um, seem to facilitate the, the practices that they are interested in or want to embrace. Ado early adopters that are, are following right behind them and trying new things. Most researchers or those uh, in open or in, uh, in science and other research practices are lumped in the middle here uh, and they, they want to or, or are willing to embrace change. They just maybe need to see um, members of their community or other communities embrace those and try those first. And then of course, some that um, need to see a lot of that, uh, need to have a lot of encouragement in order to, to move forward. And if we sort of tilt this and look at it as uh, structuring culture change and enabling culture change that we were just uh, talking about a, a moment ago, um, we see each of those teams that we were, were uh, that we're structured with um, in addition to um, how we operate within the, the scholarly landscape. So at the base of our COS pyramid here, um, we have the, the infrastructure, the technology, the, the USF in our case, um, that enables change, makes it possible to be an innovator and try new things. Um, you have to have some tools to work with in order to do that. Um, so that, that infrastructure makes our, our base and then as uh, those innovators come and, and try things and provide feedback like you are today, um, we can continue to innovate and, and uh, iterate on that technology to make it easier to use, which brings in more users that are excited about the possibilities, but maybe needed a little more, um, the, the usability had to be a little closer to where they were in order for them to, to jump on board. And then, once you start seeing that that influx of, of use and enthusiasm, um, communities can make it normative in that there is a, an assumption that this is, this is real, this is now um, going to be a typical use case for us, data sharing or using uh, data management plans or fair data. Those sort of things are embraced by communities and made, um, are embraced across uh, the, the entire group um, and then sometimes it takes a little more than that to get uh, all of the, the members of a community or multiple communities involved. Um, so we see incentives like uh, making data um, shareable, whole research objects, not just something that's cited in a paper um, as an example of, of an incentive that can encourage uh, researchers to, to, to embrace new practices. And then finally, um, we see funders and, and institutions making changes to what they would even accept in terms of what is uh, research that is uh, is published or available as part of their uh, research incentives like tenure. Um, so we see policy change and making it required. Um, that will get just about any part of the, the community that still wants to get their, their funding um, on board. And I think we're back to Jefferson to talk a little bit about this specific project that we're talking about today. Yep, thanks, Eric. Um, so this is just sort of an overview of the project. Um, we are in the midst, uh, I guess, wrapping up maybe year one, so kind of in the middle of a two-year project to uh, figure out ways to integrate uh, Center for Open Science, but really OSF the platform and Internet Archive for preservation. Uh, we were awarded an IMLS uh, NLG, our National Leadership Grant in 2019 to support this work. Uh, I have a sort of the generic um, uh, sort of mission-y abstract language from the grant application in quotations, uh, but I think this speaks pretty well to what the overarching mission is, which is leverage the intersection between open science research data, long-term stewardship activities, of library archives, and then figure out how we can link these two up uh, with downstream collaborative distributed data sharing and preservation services beyond just uh, COS and IA. Uh, so the actual work in the grant is twofold. There's technical work to actually automate the, the preservation mirroring from OSF into Internet Archive. And then, uh, of course, training, testing, use, community input, community feedback, reporting out uh, about how this, uh, how this is happening so that it can very much be community driven on how we make many of the technical decisions. And so this is this webinar is part of that. 
uh, we will uh, then, uh, after we have sort of finished some of the technical integration work between our two systems, uh, we'll, we have some other partners that will do a sort of prototype, very, uh, you know, low scale uh, integrations to then get the data from IA uh, into other preservation systems that uh, people might be using locally. Uh, and then lastly, we'll, of course, roadmap further integrations beyond just the content in scope for this project. So I just figured I would talk a little bit about some of uh, the preservation partners specific to this grant and the ones that at least we Internet Archive also work with. So uh, we do much work with uh, LOCKS. That's lots of copies keep stuff safe. It's a preservation network uh, that many people are member, uh, members of. You can establish sort of it's a network based uh, replication protocol fixity checking thing. You can set your set up your own network. They also have a global LOCKS network. Uh, we, Internet Archive, and some of the services we provide, we do uh, replicate the data that we are archiving to LOCKS on behalf uh, of partners that want it. We have also done many uh, technical development, uh, collaborative technology API development kind of projects with LOCKS too. Uh, so we work with them quite closely. They are involved in this project, so we will be putting uh, some of this data that is, uh, you know, totally open or CC0 or whatnot uh, into the LOCKS network just to make sure uh, to test uh, the, the redistribution of the preservation content into LOCKS. Um, we are doing the same with AP Trust, Academic Preservation Trust. This is another uh, collaborative digital preservation network of I think around 35 or 40 uh, academic institutions uh, who we also have worked with on other projects. And so they will be taking some of the OSF content that is married to IA uh, that is relevant to, to their member institutions. Uh, another project partner is Los Alamos National Library. Um, they actually run their own instance of OSF uh, within uh, LANL. And so they provide a very interesting use case uh, that we wouldn't really be able to do otherwise of how to, preserve, uh, how to test our integrations uh, on a localized OSF instance. Um, so that's, uh, they're also a, a sort of official partner. And then also the PressQT project at Notre Dame. Uh, we'll also be taking uh, some of the OSF data and testing it in their workflows. Uh, I put uh, some others on here that we've worked with, both, uh, mostly for uh, open data or open science projects. Uh, DAT is a decentralized web protocol. We had a pilot project working with uh, DAT and some of the uh, data in uh, California Digital Library's uh, open data system. Uh, so that was very testy and prototypey, and we have other decentralized web partnerships uh, just to test and, and see how it works to get uh, open, totally open science or open research data uh, into some of these uh, D-Web type systems. Uh, and we also, over the years, have worked very closely with DuraCloud, uh, which is part of DuraSpace, now part, uh, now under the Lyricist umbrella, uh, and many of, uh, they sort of have a a preservation management system that uh, is on top of some of the commercial cloud services that many of our uh, joint partners use. And so we have some automated systems for uh, getting data that IA may have collected or taken a copy of into Dura Cloud. Uh, to just dig into one of the examples of those, especially locks, uh, which I think is maybe the most relevant to the most number of people, uh, maybe on the call because uh, they have a pretty broad partnership network, uh, as, as do we. Uh, many of the Internet Archive partners use us for either collecting or for uh, having a copy outside of their own uh, institution mirrored at Internet Archive and then are interested in having it mirrored maybe if they end up becoming a member of a LOCKS network. Uh, but for most of them, they're collecting using our tools in Internet Archive. Uh, and then while we, of course, keep copies for them, they also want these copies in other places. Uh, and it's often in the LOCKS network, so we've done many integrations. This is just a little diagrammatic that is what, what that workflow looks like. They're usually harvesting things either from the web or maybe they're using our, our digitization services at IA. Uh, these these digi digital objects or files or whatever they might be, then of course go into IA storage, and I'll have a copy that talks a little bit more about our storage and preservation work uh, after this. Um, we then, can do two different things. We can either distribute that content automatically into LOCKS networks that are outside of Internet Archive. Um, 
but we have also in the last couple of years worked with locks to host our own locks nodes within ia so we have locks nodes up and running that we can link to an existing uh, private locks network um, or that can be part of a new private locks network uh, that is and we're just a node in a in some sort of private network that others uh, are are spinning up the advantages to that are that obviously we can put the data there pretty easily because we're already running the locks node uh, it's it's separate within our infrastructure, but still within our infrastructure, it's much lower cost. And then it is then automatically networked using using the locks protocols and just how locks works. Uh, so it doesn't it's automatically networked across a whole locks automatically replicated across a whole locks network, uh, which means that an institution that we don't have to put it into a network uh, ourselves or an institution takes the copy and puts it in there. So there's there's a good deal. Of, uh, uh, saving of effort of mirroring and shuffling data around by that. Uh, then as people continue to use our services, it continues to happen. Uh, yeah, and then new nodes can come online. Uh, so what else do we do at Internet Archive around uh, digital preservation? Uh, some of the advantages that, that we have is we do, of course, run, own, run, and operate all our own data centers. Uh, we can put things in the commercial cloud if, if someone really wants us to. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we are a cloud provider. Uh, we just happen to be a nonprofit one. Uh, we don't make money on it. We do it at cost, all those things. And we are really only working with uh, mission aligned organizations that are nonprofits that are uh, advancing open science, that are advancing library and archives missions uh, or social good or social impact. Uh, and we can do a lot of these things end to end, which is not just collecting, indexing, uh, building people websites to uh, for discovery of their stuff uh, and then replicating data into preservation networks. We are far cheaper than the commercial cloud. Uh, we don't charge for bandwidth. Um, you know, we do have hardware costs and it does cost some money to store stuff, uh, but we also, uh, you know, get some exemptions around some of that. Um, we have a lot of engineering uh, capacity, both uh, people, but also just the physical infrastructure. Uh, and we do have, you know, as I mentioned, hundreds and hundreds of community partners. So it's very easy for us to do partnerships and integrations and things like that. We're very API first. We try to operate in a uh, systems oper interoperability mindset uh, instead of you know, trying to building things from scratch. Uh, and yes, we do have a sort of global reach and lots of partnerships and collaborations. Next slide. Uh, what do people ask us to do beyond what we do out of the box? Uh, we can do as many redundancy copies as people want. So I don't, I don't know what the most would be, but we can uh, do 1 million copies of a, a super precious special file. Um, but certainly more than two uh, is something that we do. Uh, customize fixity check frequencies. We put things in multiple storage architectures. So there's, uh, it's agnostic to specific storage technologies. We have data centers outside of the United States, as well as ones outside of uh, just the Bay Area, our main location. So we can do geopolitical uh, redundancy and distribution. Uh, we mentioned some of the automation aspects. Uh, we don't uh, charge for ingest or egress, which is how the commercial cloud makes most of its money. Uh, so the accessing files really doesn't cost anything. It's mostly the storage, uh, the permanent storage and just the infrastructure cost. And as we mentioned, we're a nonprofit. Uh, there's just a little dashboard that we made because <laughs> it helps to visualize what some of these things look like and some of the services that we provide. So a lot of the Internet Archive is uh, done like at a very you know, minimum viable product, which is uh, totally sufficient for many of our partners who might be tiny, tiny organizations uh, and ones that uh, pay us for more advanced work or for higher fixity checks, replicas. Uh, we have we have specialized services for and, and, you know, UIs for those. So that's it for me. Oh, yep. So our project timeline before I hand it on current status, I mentioned we're about halfway through. We have developed the prototype. Uh, so that is the automated transfer of registration data. And Eric will talk a little bit more about that uh, from OSF to IA. So we have done the technical work to automate the transfer process and checking that and, uh, and the, how it happens and the frequency and issues that may come up just in the transfer of data. And we are basically at this point of getting feedback on the prototype. So engaging uh, both the researcher community that's creating a lot of the data as well as 
the preservation and the library archives community uh, that wants to steward this data further, take copies of it, or at least be uh, involved in the decision-making process around uh, metadata issues, metadata mapping, format uh, conversions, and just how the long-term preservation actions uh, will happen, whether they're done by Internet Archive or whether a copy is taken and they're done locally. So that's where we are. We're going to, after the feedback gathering stage, we'll update the prototype. Uh, we'll, we'll production launch it. Uh, we'll do all the dissemination around training and documentation uh, and things like that. Uh, and then the, sort of the last stage of the project is distributing it to additional preservation networks, the prototype work I talked about, uh, as well as exploring additional content sets uh, for uh, building integrations around. So more to come. All right, thanks Jefferson. Uh, so as Jefferson just mentioned, the uh, the key component that is going to be moving from OSF um, to uh, through this this Internet Archive project um, are registrations on on the OSF. And uh, if you're working with or you're part of a few different uh, research disciplines, registration is something you've used or or heard of. Um, in the clinical fields or, or psychology, uh, whether that was on the OSF or not. Um, and the registries are a particular um, uh, object within the OSF, and I'll show you what one looks like in a moment. Um, for those that are not familiar with, with registrations, they don't really uh, replace uh, different kinds of research outputs. Instead, they supplement those um, and a, a registration creates a, a permanent time stamped version um, of in, in the OSF's case your your project um, your files so that you can describe what your project intends to do what your hypotheses are what your um, uh, your data gathering um, and your other methods are going to be before you go and do that work so that you can demonstrate uh, transparency through that research process. And, and the value um, of a, a registration can really will depend on how much information you are including at that time of, of registration. So uh, at minimum, um, we're hoping that you include a, a research question, um, your population and your sample size, your general um, experiment or study design, and then variables uh, to be collected in data sets that you'll be using. And there's some variability to this based on um, exactly what you're, you're registering and, and how you're doing so. Uh, but generally that's what a registration is expected uh, to have. And there's a, a few reasons to do that. I mentioned sort of generally a, a practice of transparency in your, um, in your design and, and publications of your work. Um, it also helps to reduce the file drawer effect um, so that you can register a, a study that, um, you know, maybe the, the data doesn't pan out and it didn't have a real uh, sexy result, but that's okay. That, and that data can be, still be extremely valuable. It may not get published in your first choice, but it doesn't have to go away entirely. It could be, as a registration, it's to be a really valuable um, uh, data object that others or yourself uh, may continue to use and you can cite in that registration. Uh, and then the registered analysis plans, again, depending on how much information you include in your uh, registration, can help improve the study accuracy and, and replicability uh, by guarding against that uh, the false positive inflation to, to help uh, to help improve your chances of, of publication. So that's not really helping science move forward. Obviously it doesn't help with replicability. Uh, so registrations can help to, to prevent that. So I've set up a, an OSF project uh, for us today. And this link will be in your slides. You can go and, and visit it now as well. Um, and we're gonna look at this project and set up a registration right now uh, live so that you can see what this looks like, um, and then uh, Lori will sort of take it from there and show us um, what the rest of this project life cycle, uh, this collaboration project cycle looks like. Uh, so this is our project for today. You see all of us here as 
contributors and our DOI. Um, and one of the uh, modules here on our OSF projects is registrations. And I've already actually uh, submitted, um, completed one registration for this project. I used a uh, template called OSF pre-registration. This one happens to be uh, an embargo because it's not ready to quite go public in that case. We're going to start a new registration so we can see it beginning to end. And one of the first things you'll notice here, um, there are several options for a template uh, for submitting or for completing my registration. And these vary uh, depending on their purpose as well as uh, sometimes the discipline or publication or destination of this work. Um, so you'll see some specific um, uh, locations or affiliations with a few of these and, and more like that uh, to come as some communities uh, start defining their own templates for registrations that will be available in the OSF soon. Uh, today we're going to use an open-ended registration just because this one is an opportunity to just do a narrative um, description of what our uh, study will involve just so we can go quickly. Um, we're going to keep our, our title today from our project um, and we have an opportunity to define what kind of object this is. So if we're only registering, uh, registering our procedures today, we could do that. Um, in our case, we're just gonna keep uh, the project. I have an opportunity to set uh, an affiliation of this registration because I personally have multiple registration, uh, multiple affiliations available. I'm gonna go ahead and, and keep my uh, Center for Open Science affiliation uh, present and choose a uh, discipline and a tag, just preservation today, and proceed. Um, and with several of the other formats, we'll see um, significantly more specific information requested because we're using this narrative uh, version. It's much, uh, much shorter in terms of how many sections are requested, but still the idea would be to include um, the, the necessary information on today, we're just gonna add a, a paragraph about what our, our goal was for the webinar today and proceed. We'll have an opportunity to uh, review our uh, registration. And then upon completion of an opportunity to embargo for up to four years, um, like I did with our uh, other registration on the project. Um, in our case, we're just gonna go ahead and uh, make this registration public. Um, and it takes a, a moment to archive based on how much information you've included, but uh, this will now be a timestamped um, uh, version of our project with the new narrative that I've included for our registration. Uh, in this specific, on this specific project. So with that uh, in mind, and I know that's um, a, a whirlwind tour of a registration, um, but we do want to get uh, some of your feedback uh, again on a new poll that we've just shared uh, to get a, a sense of when you would uh, expect the registration um, to start uh, the process of the, you know, the life cycle of this collaborative uh, project with Internet Archive and, and be archived. Um, would you expect it to be initiated by the researcher separate from the, the uh, registration walkthrough that we just did? So I could go to that registration that was already completed um, and claim at that point that I would like it to be archived um, or would you expect or prefer that um, automatically when I complete that process of registering uh, the project as we just walked through um, at that point it is automatically archived. Um, obviously there's gray area there perhaps um, and you can uh, tell us a little bit about if you have a different expectation um, in the the Q and A uh, box, but um, if one of those two uh, extremes would uh, 
align with your expectations, uh, give us an idea of, of uh, what you would prefer or expect. And we'll leave that poll up for a moment uh, while I pass it over to Lori. So I'm gonna switch you over to host if you Thanks, uh, Eric. Let's are you able see. to claim it, Lori? I think it's once you stop, I oh. can start. There we go. All righty. Great. And let's see. So, um, not, uh, let's see, is the poll still going? Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is show the part of the process, um, how basically how the preservation happens or how that um, gets into um, the Internet Archive. Um, and if you, you'll get a copy of these slides at the end, so you'll be able to sort of click on these links that we've shared and be able to sort of access um, uh, some of these sort of beta examples of, um, of a registration preserved on archive.org. Um, but I'm going to walk you through this in, in the browser. Um, so this is sort of um, an existing registration that we used as, as an example of, um, of the process. And um, you know, uh, Eric very, very nicely walked through the process of kind of adding this overview information. Um, and there can also be sort of files and other components that are a part of the registration. And what we do is we take all of that information um, and bundle it together um, using Bagit um, and preserve it on, um, on the Internet Archive. So the, the overview information um, we grab um, via API and make a JSON file of it. And all of that information populates into an item on, on the Internet Archive. And this is what it looks like. The goal here is preservation, um, not necessarily you know, access or um, sort of like the front end. Um, piece of it, um, but you can see overview information about this registration. Um, you can see a link back to the nice, um, you know, kind of uh, pretty OSF page for this registration. Um, and you can see here there's a, there are a few associated items or registrations that each have their own um, page that looks just like this. Um, and each has their own link back to the OSF registration page. Um, you can also kind of view the, the metadata um, behind this. So information about uh, what, was, what is part of this, um, this item. So information about each of the files as well as sort of the high level um, metadata description that's shown on the archive.org page here. Um, if you want to see all of the files, if you want to download them, for example, for um, local uh, storage or for integration with other external systems, you can click to see um, all of those files and they're in sort of a directory structure. Um, so you can see, um, you can see kind of a full list of, sorry, of, um, of what's included and you can kind of click in um, specifically to the data, for example, and see what this JSON of the registration itself looks like. Um, so this includes all of that um, really kind of important uh, information that, that was added during the registration process that, that Eric showed. Um, and you can kind of see high level um, here, uh, this is the, the sort of sandbox collection for what we've uh, pulled over so far um, in this sort of beta testing uh, period. Um, and you can kind of imagine that there could potentially be um, 
uh, collections of registrations that are affiliated with a specific organization um, or other ways to sort of group registrations together um, on archive.org for preservation purposes if that was of interest. Um, so those are kind of the basics of how this content shows up in, um, in the Internet Archive and, and sort of um, the, the preservation aspect. Um, we have a couple more things to go through, um, including another poll um, before um, we uh, wrap things up and have, and have some questions. So. Um, so here, our, our goal is to get more information about what um, registration metadata is most important to you. Um, and, and feel free to choose as many options as apply. Um, there's a lot of different types of metadata that's collected, and they may have differing levels of importance depending on your, um, your goals and your sort of um, institutional use cases. Give it a few more um, more seconds for folks to um, choose the the applicable options for them. And we have gotten some questions um, via via Q and A, and we'll mostly I think answer those towards the end. record. Yep, it looks like descriptive metadata is the most um, of interest, but there's a pretty wide um, disbursement of options there. Or preferences, let's see. Whoops. Great. Um, so a little bit more about some of the upcoming and future work that we have going on for this um, for this project. Um, we're going to continue gathering and integrating feedback, having you all here um, providing um, feedback, answering polls, and hopefully having some lively discussion um, here shortly is, is a really important part of this process. Um, we'll continue to refine the prototype to incorporate feedback that we receive. Um, and we'll do some further systems integration testing that, that um, Jefferson talked about with some of our, some of our partners. Um, and do a production release. Uh, there's also, um, you know, uh, UI work, training materials. We, we want to make sure that people um, know that this option is available, know how it works, get some, get some additional sort of um, outreach out there. Um, we will be pushing data from the Internet Archive to external preservation partners and systems that Jefferson mentioned. Um, and then we'll be doing some, some specification gathering, some um, planning for additional OSF content um, uh, integrations, so um, beyond registrations alone. Um, okay, one more poll. So, uh, what would you, um, what would you do with the registrations once they're on um, in the Internet Archive? Um, and you know, there are a number of of different options, things that that might be of interest. And again, um, with any of these polls, if you have an if you have an idea that isn't isn't um, represented in the options, do chat that in. Um, because there may be some that, that we hadn't considered. Um, there's always a variety of use cases um, in, in any group.
Right. Let's see. Um, it looks like most, um, the most common uh, option was ingesting into an IR um, or an institutional um, IR. And uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, breadth across the options there too. So thanks for answering the polls. Um, and we have some other sort of open questions or things that we're still kind of working through um, and where we could, we could use um, some additional feedback um, about sort of how to how to curate um, this content more, you know, once it's on um, the Internet Archive site, um, what what folks' goals are around that, um, what are some of the metadata and protocol needs? You know, we asked about about um, you know in the previous poll about what metadata is most important, um, but more specific information about needs around that is, is really useful. Um, sort of different, um, different uh, metadata and um, other, other types of, of protocols that, that we might use or want to support, how the data goes into IA, whether it's a push or pull model, um, how to deal with updates to the content, um, how to deal with other types of scholarly content, dealing with things like preprints, data sets, et cetera, and how to make this really extensible. Um, so these are some of the things that we're interested in getting feedback about now and you know, in the near future. Um, so I think as we're sort of nearing, getting through our time, um, we'd like to really open it up for questions and feedback. We have all of our information here. Um, and I think one of the first Q&A questions that we got was about who to reach out to at IA around um, LOCKS integrations. And Jefferson or I, the first two options there, are um, good folks to reach out to about that. Um, we'll get, uh, you'll get follow-up, email, poll results, webinar slides, additional resources um, shortly. So um, in case you're, you're wondering about that, but we, we'd um, like to open it up and I think we'll start answering some of the questions that came in over Q&A. Yeah, I think one of the questions um, mentioned in here, I think has been answered, but I wanted to um, elaborate or, or spend some more time on it. And that's the question about is the intention to have files or the contents of these files associated with a registration archived as well, or just the HTML content. Um, and I think from what Lori demoed, you were able to access files, but I don't know if you want to pull that back up to uh, show that off a little bit more in detail and see if um, Matt has sure. any more questions about that because um, the goal is to archive all of it. So to give, um, to, to preserve the, the registration template. So the questions and responses that are part of sort of that pre-commitment of a pre-registration or any registration type, um, along with any files that get uploaded um, or exist on that project at that time to create that timestamped immutable version. So. Um, I hope that answers the question, but I'm happy to see if others uh, want to chime in on the Q&A with any further, um, further parts of that that we can actually dig into and, and show off right now. The and example that I used didn't actually have any files associated with it, but they would, they would be there if, they, if there were files associated. Yeah, I think it has like a TXT file or something. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's any not of that the greatest show. example for that, but yeah. yeah, every file, and there would also be a metadata file uh, or a metadata a JSON metadata file about the file. Yeah. So any of the data um, would would show up there. And I think we mentioned before too that we were using the Bagot protocol for how we are taking an OSF registration and and sort of comprising it into a package that can be handed off. So um, I don't, I think we said that, but if that's useful to understand how, how that's actually um, happening on the back end, that's the, that's the, the format we're using. 
yeah, the question may have been sort of like, are we crawling it like in a web crawling, web archiving kind of sense? And the answer is no, no, we could, but uh, the integration is API, two APIs. So. Which also um, will mean that <clears throat> if, an, uh, if a registration gets withdrawn, um, we will send an update over to Internet Archive about the, piece, the, the parts that are no longer relevant and what should be removed. Um, it looks like there's a question um, in here about how does the Internet Archive work with Europe's right to be forgotten laws? Um, I will have to defer to Lori or Jefferson on that one. Yeah, we do. You know, we are a US based institution, but we do have European partners. So the, this does come up. Um, the right, right to be forgotten is a little weird, and then it's not exactly like a legal mandate. But the general high level Internet Archive policy, as with many other online platforms, probably Center for Open Science as well, is the, uh, that we do have teams that are responsive to take down requests. So, um, you know, if people are, you know, right now this project is working with open content, right? So it's, um, you know, the, the users are sort of determining in advance that it's open and doesn't meet that. But if at some later point it did, then we have mechanisms and teams and workflows that can respond to uh, take down, withdrawal, deletion requests, those types of things. Um, I think we have a clarification to, to see if we can answer. Um, with, will the withdrawal of content from IA for a withdrawn OSF registration be automatic or manual? And that would be automatic. If it's one that's been pushed, then it will be updated automatically. Yep, so that's part of the integration is that actions that happen in OSF even after the registration is created will impact the part of the IA version that may already have been replicated. I think the one question that sometimes comes up around that is will uh, like overwriting data or something if data is edited uh, post post preservation ingest. Generally since the data in scope for a edit which is usually just a metadata field or something is pretty trivial we would actually just make a new copy instead of overwriting it. So our approach is archival. We don't generally delete much of anything, um, if not, if it isn't necessary to delete it. So for when it's like overwriting metadata, we would probably just uh, version control or versionize uh, the, the relevant JSON metadata blob. So that the, the current one would be current, but the, the former ones would still be there. If that makes sense. Yeah, we also have a uh, sort of a temporal question from our friend uh, Natalie Myers in the chat. Uh, at the point of archiving, is it publicly available on both endpoints uh, on OSF and the Internet Archive endpoint? Yes, I believe so. If it's open on one, it will be open on the other. Yeah, it's, it's a mirroring and not a transfer. Just, I think that's the point of clarification. So it'll be available both places. Well, we're certainly interested in hearing from folks about the metadata stuff. I think uh, for, the, for registrations, just uh, given the, uh, not complexity, but the nature of the hierarchical com componentization of it, there is a lot of metadata. And you can even see like in Lori's demo that, um, you know, there's metadata basically for every object and, and often for the transaction itself too. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear how people, uh, work with that locally, you know, there's the, a lot of that you could probably get uh, from OSF itself and on, and even more you can probably get from uh, the IA mirror copy. 
Um, a lot of that would not be useful if people are just interested in preserving the sort of canonical parts of a OSF registration or project or whatever uh, it might be, uh, but some of it might be. So I think one of the things we're hoping to get uh, through this webinar and definitely through this phase of the project is input on, um, on that aspect. Yeah, and, and we're, we're winding down on time, but there's um, a couple questions related to um, user uh, account security and um, specifically around hacking someone's account and then removing some of their research content from the OSF. Um, I'm happy to follow up with that person more to understand um, the complexities that you might be dealing with. Um, we do have security measures in place on the OSF accounts. Um, with two-factor authentication um, to ensure that no one can log in as you if you have that enabled. Um, additionally, just a, a couple little tidbits that we rushed through when we were demo, sort of doing the, the quick demo of, of, reg, of a registration, but to create a registration, if Eric and I were doing a collaborative research project, we were both administrators of that research. Um, if I were to initiate a registration, I could push it through to archiving, but then it needs his approval. Um, and he could say, no, I'm not ready for this to be made public and all of my, um, you know, research protocols be out there publicly and he could, he could actually uh, not approve that registration to be made public, which would mean it would not move forward. If he didn't respond within 48 hours, then it would move forward. You can also embargo registrations for up to four years, which would mean that that wouldn't be made public um, immediately. The same process actually takes place when a withdrawal is, um, is requested. So if Eric, if, if, if Eric and I did approve that registration, it's made public, but Eric decides he wants to withdraw it for whatever reason, um, I would also get that email request again to approve withdrawal of that registration. And there's my opportunity to say, wait a minute, I didn't, I, I didn't, agree with that um, and I don't want my research taken down um, and therefore I could not click um, I could actually cancel uh, the withdrawal um, or if I don't then within 48 hours um, it's like I silence his acceptance in some way um, and let it let it move forward so those are some measures that we put in place to help protect authors from either exposure of research that they're not ready for it to be made um, public out there or same thing on the other end where something could be taken down that you didn't want to be removed from public view. So hopefully that answers those questions. I'm again, really happy to, to follow up um, with that uh, person uh, down the road to, to make sure that if there's other uh, specifics that need to be thought through that we're happy to consider those as well. Um, it seems like all of the questions um, have um, looked at, uh, have been answered. And so I really wanna thank everyone for participating and listening to us describe the work that we're doing and hopefully providing um, some good awareness around this project and potentially some value down the road to to each of you and your institutional needs um, and to also help us with the feedback you've provided those polls will be something that we actually uh, spend quite a bit of time on evaluating and doing some analysis on and incorporating into the updates that we're going to be making um, so, so we're very appreciative of that and for your time. Um, as the slide indicates, you can reach out to any of us with any of these questions, especially if, um, during this live Q&A. Um, it's really difficult because you can't talk to us. So we're sort of inferring what we think you mean by some of the questions. And so um, certainly reach out and we're happy to continue the conversation after the webinar ends. Um, and there will be a follow-up email with more information. So with that, I just want to thank everyone um, and say goodbye. Yes.